everybody. Happy Friday. We have a COVID-19 briefing with Dr. Teresa Tam and Dr. Howard New joining us virtually. We'll begin with opening remarks and then turn to the room and phone lines for questions with a hard out at 1230. So over to you, doctors. Thank you very much. And bonjour à toutes et à tous. Last week's modeling update illustrated how the large surge in Omicron infections was likely to peak in January and then recede into February. In the weeks since the modeling update, there are early indications that infections may have peaked at the national level, including daily case counts, test positivity, RT, or the effective reproduction number, and wastewater surveillance trends. However, daily hospital and ICU numbers are still rising steeply, and many hospitals across Canada are under intense strain. Nationally, the average daily case count has decreased by 28% compared to the previous week. Although there is a degree of underestimation due to current testing policies, the seven-day average of close to 27,000 cases reported daily as of January 19th shows continuing high rates of infection, as well with over 22% of lab tests positive for the COVID-19 virus. Disease activity remains widespread across the country. Modeling also showed us that the high volume of Omicron cases was expected to result in an unprecedented number of new daily hospital admissions exceeding historical maximums. Over the past week, an average of over 10,000 people with COVID-19 were being treated in our hospitals each day, surpassing peak daily numbers for all previous waves of the pandemic. This includes over 1,100 people in intensive care units, which is higher than all but the third wave peak. During the same period, there were on average 131 deaths reported each day. Evidence continues to show that being vaccinated with two or more doses of COVID-19 vaccines lowers the risk of hospital admission. As well, having a booster dose of either Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna mRNA COVID-19 vaccine helps improve protection that may have decreased since the second dose and results in a better protection against severe illness from Omicron in particular. With over 6.5 million eligible Canadians needing a first or second dose of the primary series and many others who are eligible for a booster dose, there are still more opportunities to enhance our protection individually and collectively with COVID-19 vaccines. Among adolescent and adult age groups, vaccine coverage with two or more doses range from 83% to 96%, with room for improvement, particularly on booster dose coverage for adults, which ranges from 21 to 75%. For children aged five to 11 years, who more recently became eligible for COVID-19 vaccination, the key opportunity in getting more children on the path to vaccine protection by starting their primary series and raising vaccine coverage up from the present 51% with at least one dose. One of the ways we work to build confidence among this age group is through the Immunization Partnership Fund, or IPF. The IPF supports trusted organizations across Canada to share credible, timely COVID-19 vaccination information with their communities. These organizations can help reach underserved and under-vaccinated populations with tailored outreach and interventions to fill information gaps and reduce vaccination barriers. Next Thursday, a number of organizations, including IPF-funded recipients, Children's Healthcare Canada and Signs Up First, as well as experts from across disciplines, will be coming together to promote vaccine confidence and highlight the importance of building up protection among children during National Kids and Vaccines Day. I encourage parents and guardians, together with their children, to take the opportunity to engage with experts and advocates that respect and support the need for informed and confident decision making. But we still have some difficult weeks ahead and potential for more bumps along the way. 
our many months of efforts have given us better protection with vaccines and brought us several effective treatments that we remain hopeful will change the face of the pandemic to reduce severity going forward. We can all help to ease the path to better days ahead by getting our COVID-19 vaccines up to date and continuing to reduce infection rates by laying, layering personal protections such as masking and limiting in-person contacts as much as possible. Thank you. Merci, Megwich. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. La mise à jour sur la modélisation de la semaine dernière a révélé à quel point la hausse marquée des infections attribuables au variant Omicron risquait d'atteindre un sommet au janvier, puis de se ressorber en février. Au cours de la semaine qui a suivi cette mise à jour, les premières indications montrent que les infections pourraient effectivement avoir atteint un sommet à l'échelle nationale, notamment par le nombre de cas quotidiens le taux de positivité des tests, la valeur, la valeur RT ou taux de reproduction effectif et les tendances relatives à la surveillance des eaux usées. Cependant, le nombre quotidien d'hospitalisations et de personnes aux soins intensifs continue de montrer en flèche et de nombreux hôpitaux au Canada sont soumis à une forte pression. Au pays, le nombre moyen de cas par jour a diminué de 28 par rapport à la semaine précédente. Bien qu'il y ait un certain degré de sous-estimation en raison des politiques de dépistage actuelles, la moyenne sur 7 jours soit près de 27 000 cas signalés quotidiennement à partir du 19 janvier, montre des taux d'infection constamment très élevés. De même, avec plus de 22 des tests de laboratoire qui affichent un résultat positif au virus de la COVID-19, l'activité de la maladie demeure largement répandue d'un bout à l'autre du pays. La modélisation nous a, nous a également révélé que le nombre élevé de cas du variant Omicron devrait se traduire par un nombre sans précédent de nouvelles, hospita de nouvelles hospita hospitalisations quotidiennes Dépasse, dépassant ainsi les maximums maximum historiques. Au cours de la dernière semaine, en moyenne, plus de 10 000 personnes atteintes de la COVID-19 ont été traitées chaque jour dans nos hôpitaux, ce qui dépasse les chiffres quotidiens maximum de toutes les vagues précédentes de la pandémie. Ce chiffre comprend plus de 1 100 personnes dans les unités de soins intensifs, ce qui est supérieur à tous les sommets atteints, sauf celui de la troisième vague. Au cours de la même période, le nombre moyen des décès signalés chaque jour se chiffrait à 100. 31. Les données probantes continuent de montrer que le fait de recevoir au moins deux doses de vaccin contre le groupe COVID-19 réduit le risque d'hospitalisation. En outre, le fait de recevoir une dose de rappel qu'il s'agisse de vaccin AA, RNM contre la COVID-19, de Pfizer-BioNTech ou de celui de Moderna contribue à améliorer la protection qui peut avoir diminué depuis la deuxième dose et à offrir une meilleure protection contre les formes graves de la maladie attribuable à Omicron en particulier. Comme plus de 6,5 millions de Canadiens admissibles ont encore besoin d'une première ou d'une deuxième dose de vaccin pour compléter leur série initiale et que beaucoup d'autres sont admissibles à une dose de rappel, il reste encore des occasions d'améliorer notre protection individuellement et collectivement grâce au vaccin contre la COVID-19. Dans les groupes d'âge des adultes et des adolescents, la couverture vaccinale avec au moins deux doses varie de 83 à 96 mais des améliorations sont possibles, notamment en ce qui concerne la couverture des doses de rappel pour les adultes, qui varie de 21 à 75 dans le cas des enfants âgés de 5 à 11 ans qui sont devenus plus récemment admissibles à la vaccination contre la COVID-19, la principale opportunité consiste à guider un plus grand nombre d'entre eux vers la voie de la protection vaccinale en amorçant leur série primaire et en augmentant la couverture vaccinale, qui est actuellement de 51 avec au moins une dose. Le Fonds de partenariat d'immunisation, ou FPI, est l'un des moyens que nous utilisons pour instaurer la confiance auprès de ce groupe d'âge. Le FPI aide les organismes de confiance de partout au Canada à transmettre à leur communauté 
des renseignements crédibles en temps opportun sur la vaccination contre la COVID-19. Ces organismes peuvent contribuer à joindre les populations mal desservies et peu vaccinées grâce à des mesures de sensibilisation et à des interventions adaptées visant à combler les lacunes en matière d'information et à réduire les obstacles à la vaccination. Jeudi prochain, un certain nombre d'organismes, notamment les bénéficiaires d'un financement du FPI, Santé des enfants Canada, et la séance d'abord, ainsi que des spécialistes de diverses disciplines se réuniront pour promouvoir la confiance à l'égard des vaccins et souligner l'importance de renforcer la protection des enfants à l'occasion de la Journée nationale de la vaccination pour les enfants. J'encourage les parents et les tuteurs ainsi que leurs enfants à profiter de l'occasion pour discuter avec des experts et des défenseurs qui respectent et soutiennent la nécessité d'une prise de décision éclairée et en toute confiance. Même si nous avons encore des semaines difficiles devant nous et que nous risquons de rencontrer d'autres obstacles, les efforts que nous déployons depuis de nombreux mois nous ont permis d'obtenir une meilleure protection grâce aux vaccins et de mettre au point plusieurs traitements efficaces qui, nous l'espérons, changeront le visage de la pandémie et en réduiront la gravité à l'avenir. Nous pouvons tous contribuer à tracer la voie vers des jours, des jours meilleurs en nous assurant que nos vaccins contre la COVID-19 sont à jour et en continuant de réduire les taux d'infection en combinant, combinant les mesures de protection personnelle comme porter un masque et limiter les contacts en personne le plus possible. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, doctors. We have quite a bit of time for questions today, but given that we had very few people able to get through on the phone lines on Monday, I'll ask for questions to be brief and answers as well to be brief if possible. We'll start in the room with Mackenzie Gray and then go to the phone lines. Uh, hi, Dr. Tam. Uh, my first question is about a study that came out with the CDC today. There's some really strong numbers about boosters, 90% effective against hospitalizations, 82% effective against preventing people ending up in the hospital. Uh, and people with a booster are 66% less effective to end up getting an infection against Omicron versus people who only have two shots. The top CDC advisors already come out today after this and said, look, we need to change the definition of what it means to be fully vaccinated to be three shots. So now is it only a matter of time in Canada that three shots is going to be the standard for fully vaccinated versus two shots? And I, I think um, it, it's very important to get the booster. So that is the first message, as I've said in my opening remarks. So everyone uh, should try and get the boosters as soon as they're eligible and that's a, that's really important i think um it depends on the objective of um what the definitions are used for um and a lot of it in in the jurisdiction of the provinces and territories but we will be discussing this going forward as i said once there's been more people who are having had the opportunity to access the booster doses on kids it's you mentioned dr new uh, maybe i could just add to that uh, I think there's uh, sometimes maybe a bit of confusion, I think, uh, in the general public as to, you know, what is a booster dose? And so I think uh, what uh, Dr. Tam and I are some, uh, sometimes use the uh, phraseology is better sort of keeping up to date with your vaccinations, because uh, let's say for the large part of the population, uh, maybe getting two doses, you know, maybe eight weeks apart and so might constitute what we call a primary series. You get a, a good level of immunity from uh, from that. But uh, for others who may not be able to mount an, a, a good immune response, maybe quote their primary series might actually consist of three doses as a, you know, as opposed to the two doses. So and then after that, you know, if you have a good response from your primary series, then quote a booster dose is the one that you might be giving, you know, six months or later after that sort of uh, completion of your primary series to then bring your immunity up after it wanes over time. So you're right, there's, there's still lots to uh, to look at and, and Nancy will be looking at sort of the overall question of booster doses and the timing, but I just want to maybe clarify that issue in terms of what constitutes the number of doses in a primary series versus booster. Thanks. On kids, Dr. Tam, you mentioned in your remarks that only 51% of eligible kids are fully vaccinated at this point in time, which means that there are a lot of parents out there who are fully vaccinated themselves but have decided not to make sure that their kids get vaccinated. Why do you think there's such a disconnect potentially with hundreds of thousands or millions of fully vaccinated parents not letting their kids or not wanting their kids to end up getting vaccinated? 
Yes, I think we need to look at the reasons behind this more closely. But what I do know is before the program started, that there was a very high proportion of early adopters, around 50%. So maybe that's what we're seeing. But there were quite a high proportion, 25 to 30%, I believe. Uh, I can't quite recall the exact uh, public opinion research numbers, but around that sort of ballpark of parents who are just waiting and seeing because, of course, children are very important in their lives. And the primary um, piece of information they wanted to know is, are the vaccines safe? And so I think I can, we can now safely say that millions of doses of this the, the Pfizer uh, lower dose vaccination for children have been deployed. There's no safety signals uh, of concern. And so I think it's this group of parents that we're hoping to reach in so many different ways, uh, as I've said, with the Immunization Partnership Fund to make sure parents and kids uh, get their questions answered. So I think this is the next phase to try and get uh, that next group of uh, kids vaccinated. And um, some of our experts will be providing their time next week to answer those questions. So. Uh, both access to information and access, easy access to the vaccine, I think is very key for the next phase. Okay, Patrick, we'll go to you on the phone lines. Thank you, merci. You may press star one. At this time, if you have a question, you can press on étoile one if you have a question. The première question is from Boris Prou, Le Devoir. La parole Boris Prou, from Le Devoir. Oui, question. bonjour. Uh, Ma question euh, porte sur les tests à la frontière My et euh, à, aux aéroports. Êtes-vous préoccupé par le taux euh, de positivité euh, qu'on voit pour ces tests? Et est-ce que, selon vous, le Canada devrait continuer ou cesser de tester systématiquement les voyageurs qui sont pays que les États-Unis? Merci pour la question. C'est Dr. New, peut-être moi je peux commencer. Oui, oui, c'est toujours important. Suivez, toi et moi, qu'est-ce que... C'est quoi les données qu'on reçoit à, 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 à nos frontières concernant les, 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 les résultats de positivité parmi les voyageurs? Oui, on voit que les, les taux de positivité, ça a augmenté depuis plusieurs semaines. Donc, je pense que ça, ça démontre l'importance des de, de, de mesures qu'on a prises à, à nos frontières pour protéger la, la santé et la sécurité des Canadiens. Et c'est, c'est très important aussi pour les surveillances parce que c'est pas seulement une question de diagnostiquer les, 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 les voyageurs individuellement, mais aussi pour peut-être détecter peut-être, une, peut-être une autre variant, un nouveau variant. Donc, ça, c'est, ça fait partie de notre, comme dit, notre uh, programme de dépistage à la frontière. Mais uh, c'est sûr, on continue à évaluer nos efforts à la frontière et, uh, et au fur et à mesure avec uh, la situation, uh, si ça change au Canada, mais aussi à uh, Partout dans le monde, on va continuer à évaluer et peut-être adapter comme c'est nécessaire. Merci. Et en fait, il y a plusieurs juridictions provinciales qui commencent à annoncer des assouplissements pour le mois de février. J'aimerais savoir si, selon vous, c'est approprié et si on a assez de tests rapides pour euh, cette prochaine étape. OK, c'est Dr. New encore. Merci pour la question. Écoutez, le Canada est un grand pays et la, l'expérience, qu'est-ce qui se passe actuellement sur le terrain dans chaque province et territoire et, et, et uh, aussi différent parmi uh, toutes les provinces et territoires. On, on a vu même avec Omicron que les, les deux grandes provinces, uh, Ontario et le Québec, peut-être ont commencé avec leur vague d'Omicron un peu plus uh, tôt comparé aux autres provinces. Donc, uh, je pense que c'est plus pour les autorités uh, 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 dans les provinces et les territoires, uh, vraiment regarder uh, étroitement uh, ce uh, qu'est-ce qui se passe avec l'épidémiologie, mais aussi avec uh, leurs experts de modélisation, avec les données probantes uh, qu'ils ont à leur disposition de, le, de leur propre juridiction pour prendre des décisions uh, pour uh, peut-être assouplir uh, les mesures de santé publique uh, Uh, au fur et à mesure, selon uh, les, uh, les, les données probantes. Et, uh, pour moi, c'est, c'est difficile uh, pour prononcer pour uh, chaque province et territoire, mais uh, je, je suis sûr que nos homologues des provinces et territoires sont, uh, uh, sont très comme, attentifs uh, aux, uh, aux, uh, à la, aux, aux situations et uh, on continue à regarder uh, les, les données probantes et donner leurs meilleures recommandations aux décideurs. We leave it up to decision Thank you, merci. The next question is from David Aiken from Global News. Please go ahead. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, doctors. Appreciate your time. Um, maybe, Dr. Tam, uh, this is for you. It, it sort of goes to that, uh, that fund uh, announcement today about disinformation. Uh, we have some new polling that suggests Canadians uh, do have some concerns about getting ever more COVID-19 shots, boosters. And I know, Dr. New, you were saying, you know, it's important to keep up to date on vaccines. But a lot of Canadians, when asked, you know, would you get a fourth dose? They sort of roll their eyes and go, they seem to be resistant. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about how our vaccine strategy might change the communications. Uh, is it likely we'll need annual boosters, um, strain-specific vaccines, vaccines for the most vulnerable? Only? I wonder if you could speak about the vaccine strategy in a climate where people are wondering, oh, I got to get a fourth dose or, or more doses. Yes, I think we have to examine, of course, the data uh, and in numerous streams, including the level of protection, the vaccine effectiveness studies. I think we were very fortunate to get some very effective vaccines quite early on in the pandemic. And we are essentially learning about some of the spacing in the doses and the number of doses required. But at the same time as studying that, the virus itself is also undergoing evolution. So that's another stream of data that we need to watch out for. But what we will say is that I, th I think the global opinion at this point is that the Omicron virus is going to be with us for some time. So we do need to take a longer term approach in thinking about a vaccine strategy. So I think that that's the next step. And we need to do that with the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Of course, they've been uh, asked to examine the need, for example, of a fourth dose but they are taking very thoughtful approaches to examine that question. Um, but I think everybody would appreciate that for influenza, for example, that's um, now an annual vaccine. People have had that. I've had that for decades, you know, every year. So it's not a question of whether uh, me, you know, many different doses in our lifetimes is a concern. I think we have very good examples of where Vaccines can be given um, time and again over the course of our lives, uh, but it is, I think, quite an important moment. And then the next year, leading up to the next uh, respiratory virus season, to try and work this out as much as possible. So there are a, a number of unknowns, as you've pointed out, in terms of well, what uh, strain should we be using um, and uh, who needs to get an additional dose. I, I do think that the primary objectives uh, have to be clarified. And right now, I think the key is to prevent serious outcomes. And we need to look at that going forward as well. And uh, just a, a data follow-up, really. I, th this may be available at somebody's dashboard. I just haven't seen it. Um, you, um, Dr. Tan, you talked about um, the number of people in hospitals, the number of people in ICUs um, with COVID. Do we have a rough idea of how many of those in hospitals or in ICUs are dealing with Omicron or Delta or even the Alpha variant? Do we know uh, or have some data, some perspective on which particular variant is pushing up these hospital case ca hospital counts? Yes, not everyone in the hospital will have genetic sequences done. Some will get um, targeted genetic uh, screening to look at uh, what we call an S gene dropout. So you will not get that precisely from every uh, hospitalized patient. But what we do know is from our surveillance system that is almost all Omicron. Um, ever since around December the 20th, uh, as Omicron began to really take over the majority of the genetic landscape, as it were, uh, that's what we expect to be in the hospitals right now. We're not seeing much in the way of Delta or any other variant, but we're monitoring that very closely. And by the way, including the sublineages of Omicron, which is getting a bit of news today, I think. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question de Louis Blouin, Radio-Canada. La parole est à vous. Blouin, Radio-Canada. Bonjour à vous. J'aimerais vous parler du dépistage dans les aéroports, le dépistage systématique se fait actuellement pour tous les passagers. Euh, il y a beaucoup d'experts, incluant la conseillère scientifique du gouvernement, la Mona Nemer, qui dit que c'est plus nécessaire de dépister tous les voyageurs qui arrivent au Canada, surtout que les délais de traitement sont très, très longs. Alors, est-ce que vous conseillez un retour aux tests 
aléatoire dans les aéroports. Merci pour la question, c'est Dr. New encore. Je pense qu'on a déjà répondu à, à, à cette question, mais je peux répéter que oui, c'est toujours important avec ce qu'on fait à, à, à nos frontières de toujours évaluer avec les données probantes les résultats et peut-être ajuster comme c'est nécessaire. Donc, on continue à évaluer avec les résultats, qu'est-ce qu'on voit actuellement uh, uh, sur le terrain, à, à nos frontières. Et uh, uh, au fur et à mesure, on, on va uh, analyser et, et donner des recommandations peut-être pour ajustement comme c'est nécessaire. Donc, est-ce qu'il y a des ajustements qui pourraient s'en venir au cours peut-être des prochains jours? Euh, et ma deuxième question, euh, à l'heure actuelle, il y a une autre règle qui est en vigueur qui touche beaucoup de familles canadiennes, c'est que les plus jeunes enfants là, qui ne peuvent pas être vaccinés, qui reviennent au Canada, ne peuvent pas aller à la garderie pendant 14 jours après leur retour au, au Canada. Il y a des provinces qui ont revu les règles visant les jeunes enfants. Euh, alors, le fédéral semble un peu être en contradiction avec ce qui se fait dans certaines provinces pour les, les jeunes enfants comme ça. Mme Nemer, entre autres, qui dit que maintenant, en 2022, cette restriction-là est un peu incohérente avec d'autres règles provinciales. Est-ce que vous allez lever cette restriction-là? Oui, c'est une des mises, c'est très comme dit, détaillé, mais oui, on est d'accord que oui, c'est toujours important de peut-être réviser uh, uh, qu'est-ce qu'on fait à nos frontières avec uh, l'introduction de, de Omicron et uh, qu'est-ce qui se passe actuellement dans le pays. Oui, uh, c'est sûr, il faut toujours regarder, évaluer uh, 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 qu'est-ce qu'on fait avec uh, les, les, la politique à, à nos frontières. Oui, uh, on est toujours prêt. Uh, à adapter et peut-être ajuster les, les mesures comme c'est approprié. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Mia Rabson from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the death rates that we're seeing and the death numbers we're seeing from COVID this particular month. Uh, the numbers seem to have climbed substantially, including among children, and I'm just wondering if that's Uh, severity related, or if this is still because there are just so many people getting Omicron? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there's, uh, this is Theresa Tam, I'll answer your question first. Uh, I think it is the sheer uh, volume of um, cases. And at the beginning of the Omicron wave, it was very much concentrated on younger adults. And then it began to spread into the other age groups, as one might expect. So I think the vast majority of the severe outcomes, though, are still in the elderly population, people who are over the age of 60, are the key um, population groups ending up with the more severe outcomes in the hospitals. And the mortality uh, is the highest in the very uh, old, oldest age groups. So, so that is still the trend that we're seeing. Uh, there may be some reports of severe outcomes in children, but they're still very rare. In terms of rates, they're still very low. Thank you. And earlier this week, you were at the Health Committee and you were asked a few times about the quarantine period, the isolation that have been lowered in most provinces now. Um, I'm wondering if you could say what advice the public health agency is giving provinces about easing the, these isolation dates from 10 to 7 to 5 days, et cetera, and what role testing should play in the decision about whether or not someone should come out of isolation? Yes, at, at the Special Advisory Committee, we uh, share information and the synthesis of the evidence that we have gathered on an ongoing basis with the provinces and territories. In terms of the isolation period, for example, there was very little information, as you can imagine, coming out at the beginning of the Omicron wave. And then there were a few studies that were being published, which suggested that uh, the period during which you can shed the virus and can potentially communicate is not that different from uh, other variants. Having said that, there's a sh massive number of cases And this has a great impact on our society, on our critical services, on the healthcare service itself. So provinces uh, recognizing the data that we have um, made the decisions from a policy perspective and a business continuity perspective, for example, to adjust some of the policies. 
But all of them have said that regardless whether it's five days or seven days, for the rest of that period, you have to wear a well-fitted high-quality mask and take on those other layers of protection because there's always a possibility that transmission could occur. So, so those are ongoing uh, discussions for sure. And the same with the quarantine period in terms of well, exactly what is the incubation period? What is the latent period? So we have those technical discussions, but in the end, uh, provinces have the tough job of making it work on the ground. And um, I think that's the situation that we're in now. Thank you, Merci. Discussion for sure. And the same with the quarantine period in terms of, well, exactly. I'm sorry, uh, Madame Guillemette, votre ligne est ouverte. Ça va être, okay, on vous entend, donc on entend le webcast. Work on the ground. And um, I think le volume? Can you turn that we're in now. If whoever is playing audio of Dr. Tam Thank on the you, line Merci. could stop. Discussion for sure. And the same with the quarantine period. <laughs> Madame Guillemette. I'm sorry, uh, Madame Guillemette, votre ligne est ouverte. Ça va être, okay, on vous entend, donc on a, I'll have to go with the next question. Uh, the next question is from David Thurton from CBC News. Please go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, this question is for Dr. Tan. Was she the same uh, the person? Institute of, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation out of the University of Washington has said today that the pandemic is winding down. The pandemic is winding down and will be over by April with COVID essentially becoming a seasonal flu. So, Dr. Tam, your thoughts on this, please. I think that there are many experts in the world trying to work out this question. And I don't think the um, what you just said was, uh, you know, it's necessarily the uh scenario but it is a possible scenario so i think we need to prepare for different um potential futures i think one of the scenario is that of course after this massive omicron wave uh and we have boosters and more kids are getting vaccinated the population should have a reasonably good immunity at least for this period of time and at least against the omicron variant so we need to see how that immunity continues. Um, we know that waning immunity does occur and we need to prepare for any potential unusual variants that might come along. At the same time though, we do need to lay out a strategy and a plan towards moving back to something that is nearer normality. And I, I think one thing that many experts do agree on is the Om Omicron, um, well, not the Omicron, the, uh, the COVID-19 is going to stay and the coronavirus will continue to be in the human population. So how do we manage that going forwards? I think it's quite reasonable to think that we need to plan for the next respiratory virus season as well. Thank you for that. The same institute also suggests that Omicron, the Omicron wave will essentially be over in a few weeks and that it will be time to lift mass mandates, vaccine passports and other restrictions. Uh, so, yeah, your thoughts on that as well, Dr. Tan. I think we gave some idea at the national level as to where this wave is going. So I think uh, in the January time frame, the peak may occur. But the hospitalizations and the ICU emissions may continue to increase for some time. So that's in February. And I really hope that by the end of that next month, we'll be in a better position. And during that time, people are very busy, of course, responding to the Omicron wave, but we need to plan ahead for the next phase. And that, you know, we have to focus on our goals, which I, I think has been articulated as reducing severe illness and severe morbidity and mortality, as well as reducing societal disruption. So that balance has to be uh, worked out. 
uh, there is no doubt that nobody wants to have all these restrictive measures anymore. And Omicron may or may not have put us one step towards that newer re reality. So I think, as I said, we need to plan for the different scenarios and just be ready for a time of uh, emergence of, of new variants. But we got to move on and see how we can um, make our societal functions uh, uh, closer to what they were before the pandemic. It's Dr. New. Maybe I, I can uh, just uh, comment further. You're mentioning two uh, tools and sort of the word mandates attached to that. I think you know, the way I look at it, you were talking about vaccines and masks. I think, you know, from a public health perspective, we want people to be a sort of informed and, and make that a voluntary choice, you know, to uh, uh, get a vaccine because we know that vaccines are a very important tool, safe and effective in terms of uh, how we manage uh, not just the Omicron uh, variant uh, wave right now, but just for COVID-19 into the future. So I think that's something uh, positive we need to keep building on. And as, as far as the use of uh, masks, as you put it, I think it's, it's uh, I think in many ways, an empowering uh, sort of personal protective measure that people should be encouraged. It doesn't have to be because there's a mandate. It's because people see the value in and of itself to uh, protect themselves and protect others to uh, uh, wear, a, wear a mask. And, uh, and maybe even in the future, it's not because of uh, COVID-19, but also maybe for other respiratory viruses, maybe they'll get baked in, as they say, in terms of a sort of a good uh, personal protective habit that uh, will we'll always, uh, you know, uh, maintain, uh, you know, through, uh, let's say, winter and respiratory uh, virus season. So so that's how I would look at it in terms of uh, looking at the uh, sort of the negative way in terms of, oh, we can lift mandates on, on masks, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, merci. La prochaine question de Raphaël Pirot de Agence QMI. La parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour à vous. Merci de prendre nos questions. Je veux savoir, le Canada a un des taux de lits dans les hôpitaux les plus bas des pays de l'OCDE. Je voulais savoir jusqu'à quel point est-ce que le peu de lits qu'on a influence notre gestion de la pandémie en ce moment. The few beds that we have affect our Merci pour la question. Uh, uh, moi, je suis uh, une, une spécialiste de la santé publique, uh, Dr. Tam Wai, et les autres spécialistes. On, 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 on analyse les données probantes et, et, et puis on donne nos meilleures recommandations uh, aux décideurs pour, uh, pour gérer la pandémie. Uh, la question que vous posez uh, concernant comme, uh, vraiment l'infrastructure, les systèmes de soins de santé, uh, on sait que oui, uh, peut-être dans quelques provinces, uh, il y a la, la, la capacité, c'est différent peut-être d'une province à l'autre et uh, ce n'est pas vraiment pour another. moi pour, uh, pour dire qu'est-ce qu qui se passe actuellement avec uh, la gestion de la pandémie liée au, uh, comme, dit, uh, comme vous, vous avez dit, uh, le nombre de lits dans les hôpitaux. Uh, uh, je, je peux voir, uh, on voit actuellement qu'est-ce qui se passe au Québec avec uh, leur capacité, uh, le système de soins de santé et, et c'est sûr que avec uh, la, 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 la pression sur uh, leur système de, so uh, uh, système de soins de santé avec, uh, avec uh, les, les, les hôpitaux que Uh, le gouvernement de Québec uh, continue avec uh, les, les mesures de santé publique uh, très, très sévères, on peut dire restrictives, pour, uh, pour, uh, pour, uh, pour protéger leur système de soins de santé. Mais uh, c'est une bonne question, peut-être uh, plus tard, à uh, examiner uh, ce qu'est peut-être le bon équilibre pour uh, la capacité de, 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 des systèmes de soins de santé pour uh, être, uh, comme dit, uh, prêt pour une prochaine pandémie. Mais uh, actuellement, on fait ce, que, ce qui est nécessaire pour uh, protéger uh, les, les systèmes de soins de santé, uh, je suis sûr, dans chaque province et territoire. Merci. D'accord, merci. Et um, il y a aussi, uh, le gouvernement du Canada a commandé des the unités Canadian mobiles de soins de santé. Uh, Peut-être que la réponse va être la même, mais je voulais savoir si de votre côté, vous avez recommandé peut-être le déploiement vers les provinces de ces, uh, de ces unités mobiles uh, depuis le début de la pandémie. En fait, on les a reçus, uh, je crois que c'était à la fin uh, de 2020, donc il y en a en ce moment qui sont sous-utilisés. Donc, est-ce que c'est quelque chose que, auquel vous... Um, 
Euh, Est-ce que vous êtes questionné sur euh, le fait qu'on qu ne, qu ne s'en sert pas en ce moment? Uh, oui, merci pour la question. Moi, je n'ai pas les, les, les détails, mais c'est sûr, oui, on a, on a des, des unités de mobiles, comme vous avez constaté, et, et uh, on est toujours prêt, comme le gouvernement fédéral, à répondre aux demandes, si on a une demande, parce que peut-être une, une province à déborder leur capacité pour, pour gérer la, la pandémie peut-être dans un hôpital. Et donc, on est toujours prêt et peut-être que ça fait partie d'une de, de, de gamme des options qu'on peut offrir aux, aux provinces et territoires. Mais je ne suis pas au courant avec les détails. C'est quoi l'État avec euh, les, 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 comme les demandes individuelles des, des provinces et territoires? Mais euh, je suis sûr que c'est... Ça fait partie des, des options un peu offrir aux, aux provinces et territoires. Thank you, merci. The next question is from Raisa Patel from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking our questions, Dr. Tam. Back in December, you published an annual report in which you said Canada was not prepared to handle a crisis of the magnitude of COVID-19. At the time, you said it was too early to know how Omicron would impact our pandemic response. But now that we have a better understanding of Omicron, do you think this country was not prepared to handle that variant as well? I think this pandemic has affected every country in the world, and Canada is not any different. But to sustain this response for this long is also a massive challenge. And I think, based on the last set of questions as well, that it's really difficult to uh, maintain the health system as a whole um, functioning for this long with this much pressure. So I think a lot of our panic response to the Omicron wave or this current wave that we're in, much of it is to protect that health system, particularly the healthcare system, Uh, from um, being, um, you know, really under pressure. So I think Canadians understand that that's partly why, you know, on the ground, some of the measures had to be enacted because we can't, you can't cope with this level of ICU emissions and hospitalizations without some uh, major Uh, impacts. And what is different about this wave compared to others is the absenteeism and because of the, sh of the infection rates and the high transmissibility of the Omicron wave. So it is quite a challenging wave, which is different from other waves, is the uh, continuity of the health human resource. And so I think uh, those challenges continue. And uh, But of course, we're not alone in that. And Uh, but again, only together and, and by supporting our health systems, can we get through this? And as a follow-up, then, do you think that the federal government should have done more since the onset of the pandemic to help provinces and territories expand testing capacity and healthcare capacity to prepare for surges like the one we're seeing now? Well, I think, um, you know, Every, everything is being done to try and support those, those things. As I understand it, I mean, you, you, can, you can try and buy up as many tests as possible, et cetera, but there's deployment on the ground um, that, need, is, that needs to be done. And some of it is, uh, some of the testing limitations is not because you don't have enough PCR testing uh, lab infrastructure is because some of the people were sick and some of the people who collect samples were sick. So it's a, it's a very different scenario um, to be working with. But I think getting enough vaccines, making sure there's boosters, continuing to supply uh, the testing support as, as fast and as, as much as we can, Um, those are some of the fundamentals and, of course, evolving our guidance to make sure Canadians can protect themselves as much as possible. Um, in a pandemic scenario, for example, for influenza, where we did envisage scenarios where everybody has a synchronous wave, more or less, and you're all impacted and the ability to provide surge and help each other in mutual aid is um, 
very difficult to sustain under those circumstances. And so pandemic plans always uh, have to deal with prioritization and those difficult decisions that have to be made. So I think, um, I believe everyone is doing the best that they can. Uh, but I think um, ahead of next winter, we, again, we need to plan ahead and see what we can do to uh, make sure the systems are as sustainable as they can. But I think everybody that I've talked to have said is the exhaustion of the health human resource and um, and the sickness. Thank Moderator, you. how many more questions do we have on the phone line? We have at this time uh, two questions left. Okay, great. If we could um, get both in, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Certainly. La prochaine question de Pierre Saint Arnaud, La Presse Canadienne. La parole est à vous. Oui, merci. Euh, ma première question, c'est que on a parlé de la modélisation que, qui a été faite au niveau fédéral, qui nous indique et qui semble avoir été assez juste là, que les, les cas devaient commencer à plafonner et à diminuer à partir de janvier. Euh, Qu'est-ce que votre modélisation dit au sujet des hospitalisations qui, elles, continuent à monter maintenant? Qu'est-ce qu'on peut prévoir? Qu'est-ce que vous vous avez prévu dans vos modélisations pour les hospitalisations et les soins intensifs. Merci pour la question, c'est Dr. You, Dr. New. Oui, avec, avec la modélisation, on sait toujours que uh, les, les hospitalisations, c'est un indicateur uh, tardif. Donc, uh, c'est toujours quelques semaines après, uh, après l'incidence des, des cas. Donc, uh, si on a peut-être un plateau uh, des, des, uh, des, des cas, uh, on a des, des indications peut-être qu'on uh, a presque au sommet ou peut-être au sommet, on ne sait pas. C'est toujours, uh, si on, on doit, doit regarder dans les rétroviseurs pour être sûr qu'on a passé le pic hein, déjà sur euh, la, 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 la pente descendante. Mais euh, on, on peut voir que peut-être avec les hospitalisations, ça va continuer peut-être une, une autre quelques semaines après euh, le, 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 le sommet des, des cas. Donc, si euh, on est vraiment au sommet ou presque, you know, même après le sommet des, des cas, on peut attendre encore quelques semaines des, 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 des taux élevés, des hospitalisations avant peut-être une diminution. Ça, ça c'est d'après les, après les données probantes, on a jusqu'à date, mais ça peut changer toujours. C'est toujours une question de, de, de ramasser d'autres données probantes et continuer à travailler avec, avec des, des experts dans le domaine. Merci. Ma, ma deuxième question, c'est... On, vous avez, vous faites état là, de 6 millions de Canadiens qui ne sont pas vaccinés. Euh, il y a une part importante de ces gens-là qui ne veulent pas être vaccinés, qui ne le seront pas. Euh, Est-ce qu'on est prêt à gérer la suite des événements avec une proportion aussi importante que ça de personnes qui ne sont pas vaccinées? Qu'est-ce que ça implique, au fond, pour la planification? Bon, c'est une bonne question, c'est Dr. New. Um, moi, je pense que c'est toujours important parce que c'est sûr avec uh, les personnes uh, peut-être un peu de non protégées, non vaccinées, uh, uh, c'est toujours une opportunité pour le virus de continuer à, 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 à circuler. On, on va encore avoir la, 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 la transmission peut-être importante dans quelques, quelques populations. Donc, je pense uh, avec notre planification, uh, on continue à encourager l'adhésion pour augmenter la, 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 la couverture vaccinale. Et je pense que si on veut retourner, c'est d'après moi, à une comédie, un fonctionnement de notre société, c'est aussi une question d'encourager la vaccination avec tous les moyens disponibles. Je pense qu'on a déjà atteint, comme dire, avec la population qui est bien formée, qui est qui apprécient la science, c'est eux qui ont déjà reçu leur, leur vaccin. Je pense peut-être pour motiver les autres, c'est aussi peut-être il faut peut-être donner certains privilèges aux personnes vaccinées, peut-être pour rentrer dans les, les, les espaces publics, les restaurants, tout ça, c'est un autre moyen, mais je suis sûr que c'est toujours important de, de continuer avec nos, nos efforts. C'est jamais trop tard. On dit même aujourd'hui que, hey, si vous faites partie de, 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 de la population de 6,5 millions de Canadiens, encore admissible, hey, on vous encourage, c'est jamais trop tard pour 
à avoir la première dose, la deuxième dose pour compléter la série initiale. Et on va continuer dans, dans, dans ce voie-là, mais à part de ça, c'est aussi une question de garder quoi d'autre on peut faire avec, avec les autres mesures disponibles. Thank you, merci. You may still press star one if you have a question. Vous pouvez toujours appuyer sur étoile 1 si vous avez une question. The next question is from Christine Burak from CBC National News. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you both for taking our questions. Uh, mine is on the rapid test front. Based on a research project, uh, Nova Scotia Health is now recommending people swab both their nose and throat mm -hmm. to get more accurate rapid test results. Just wanted to get your sense of that approach and the latest data on this. Uh, you know, people are to some degree relying on these tests. What should they be keeping in mind? Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a great uh, Canadian study. So uh, we really welcome that. We actually had Dr. Hatchett present to the chief medical officers uh, very recently on his uh, results. So we will be taking that into account. And I've asked our laboratory networks, our laboratory experts to take that into account and see whether we can provide some further guidance. But uh, of course, um, I think we have been discovering that the Omicron virus may be behaving a bit differently to our, the previous variants. And so this uh, approach to swabbing might be useful, but uh, different kits have different swabs. And I learned a lot about that sort of recently. Some of them are more flexible, some of them are designed a bit differently. So I think, I think the different kits need to be examined, but I think uh, his study uh, will go, uh, is very welcomed and will go go a long way in terms of helping us with our next set of recommendations. That's not to say that, well, what about the next variant, you know? So so I think it's, it's really great that these studies are being done. And uh, I look forward to our lab network, maybe uh, providing the next set of guidance that Canadians need. What would be your, um, that's great, I'm, I'm glad that you're briefed on the research project, but what would be, based on what you've seen and I guess the amount of uh, research you have done on your own recently, what's your best advice at this point for, for using rapid tests? I think Dr. Hatchett and his team's results is, is looking at how you swab and in this current context, uh, using the kits that he's examined, Uh, swabbing the back of your throat and then the nose area um, is uh, potentially provides you with the highest yield. But if you can only do one site, go along with the manufacturer's instructions and do the nasal uh, swab. So I think that uh, looks like some very sensible advice because rapid tests, um, we, we've got to make the best use of them. So if by uh, some adjustments to the swabbing technique, we can get a high yield, that's always a great thing to do. Operator, are there any other questions on the phone line? If not, we have one more in the room. There are no further questions on the phone. Okay, excellent. I will uh, take this opportunity to ask Dr. Tam a follow-up from CTV's question for my colleagues in Toronto. You said that there is a question of definition regarding boosters and whether that's part of being fully vaccinated. Can you please explain what that question is? Are you questioning whether we need booster as part of the definition for fully vaccinated? Um, that might, is that referring to an earlier question? Um, I think yeah, what we're saying to is what you that- Yeah, to yes. Mackenzie Gray. Okay, so currently, for a number of administrative purposes and in the on the ground in the province and territories for um, going into a certain setting, for example, there is a definition for, for what fully vaccinated is, which consists of really the primary series. So a two-dose vaccine, you need two doses. One dose vaccine, the Janssen vaccine is that first dose. But we all know that it is very important to get the booster dose, particularly in the time of Omicron. So we began to switch terminologies now to the concept of being up to date. So by being up to date is if you are in certain group age groups and you're eligible for the booster, 
getting the booster or the additional dose is what we mean by up to date. But that has not been built into the definition for uh, administrative purposes of whether you can enter a certain space or going to a certain task, or indeed for international travel. That has not changed. It's still the primary series or the first two doses for the most part. And But we will be re-examining re those kind of policies going forward. Particularly, uh, now is not the right time because not everybody's had the chance to get the, that additional dose or getting up to date not in Canada and certainly not globally. So we will need to re-examine that posture in the future. Thank you. And just going to Mia's question on the increasing death rates, regarding Quebec, is Quebec a leading indicator of what we will see in death rates across Canada? Or is there something different in the experience of hospital healthcare system in Quebec that is leading to higher death rates in Quebec than elsewhere? Um, I think Quebec is certainly one of the provinces that experienced the Omicron surge the earliest, so that could play into it, but there may be other factors as well, um, whether it's related to the, the actual impact of the Omicron wave in the Quebec population. But I think there were some questions about uh, differences in methodology and reporting of the deaths. Uh, so maybe a, a number of these factors are, are playing into the different um, numbers. But all to say, though, is Omicron can cause serious outcomes. We cannot trivialize this virus. Uh, many people who are particularly those at high risk can get very severely sick, and indeed, uh, many have died, and we need to do what we can to prevent those. Okay, that wraps up all our questions for today. Thank you both to Dr. Tam and Dr. New for being so generous with your time. Have a good rest of the day and happy weekend. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.